Dalton has come along and he has succinctly explained these things that were observed by all these crazy, wacky, rich white guys working in their basements with, you know, either wads of cash from their noble families, their landed gentry families, or the help of wealthy patrons. So that's, that's where we leave it. Well, Dalton says, remember, that the atom can't be divided, right? It's just this chunk of stuff. And we know that they're electrically neutral, yes? Okay, they don't have an electrical charge in general. Well, this, this device here, this thing that you see is called a cathode ray tube, okay? And all it is is a chunk of glass. It's a hollow piece of glass. We could make one in here if we had the glass tube. Oh, actually, we do have some glass tubing. So we need to take a piece of glass tubing. We would heat up the ends to a point where they were so hot we could crimp them down to closed. We would stick wires in each end before we crimped it down. So you've now got a piece of glass tube with a wire on this end and a wire on that end. And we need to create a little hole in it that we can stick a hose into and suck all the air out. So that's a cathode ray. That's all it is. We've got a hollow tube. It's got wires going in this end. It's got wires going in this end. And this thing that you see here, that's the sucker tube. So that's where they attach a, a uh, hose to that, attach it to a suction pump. We've got one here. We can create a vacuum in a bell jar here. And they suck all the air out of that tube. So what you now have is a very, very, very low pressure environment. Okay, cool. What can, you, what can you do with it? So the aforementioned rich white guys, and at this point, we're starting to see the rise of you know some more sort of formal university chemistry and physics kind of stuff uh, in Europe. Had been playing with this for a while, and at this point, there's there's almost an element of party trick to science. So you have a lot of chemists and physicists who go perform for their wealthy patrons or go perform for audiences of <clears throat> educated and noble individuals. And the cathode ray tube is kind of a party trick. Here's the cool thing. If you take one of these, this low pressure tube with wires sticking out of each end, and you run some fairly high voltage current through it, it starts to glow. Cool! <laughs> well, anything that glows is automatically neat, right? So people have known that this happens for a long time. What does it mean? Well, we don't know. But it glows. Look, give me money. Well, J.J. Thompson, who's working at what, the Cavendish Lab? Cambridge, I think. Um, I always have to refresh myself on the details. He thinks that there's actually some physical ray that's causing this. He believes that this glow is actually a physical beam of some sort. He calls it a cathode ray because it's a cathode tube. Um, you may have in your searches for cathode ray tube come across pictures of old TVs, such as that one, such as that one, big glass tube TVs. That's because that's a cathode ray tube. The old computer monitors, those are CRT monitors, cathode ray tube monitors. It's, it's a modification of the device that's just a tube with wires stuck in each end. And what you're getting is a display of cathode rays striking that viewing surface and creating an image. That's astounding. Okay, so obviously this primitive ray tube isn't doing anything like that. So Thompson plays around with cathode rays. And he does all kinds of things. Because remember, these guys are experimentalists. Um, they're making their own lab equipment. When I say we could make cathode ray tubes, if we were working in Thompson's lab, you'd all be bending glass right now. We wouldn't be talking about this. I'm sorry, we're not. Um, we tried to make cathode ray tubes in here one year. It was interesting. Um, nobody got killed. That's the upside. So we were working with a very, very high voltage source. <laughs> I would never do that again. But nobody got killed. So, um, and nothing, nothing really blew up much. So anyway, Thompson takes these ray tubes and he starts sticking stuff in them. 
or these cathode tubes. He starts sticking things in them. Okay, so what if I put a little tiny metal paddle wheel in there? Hmm? So I'm going to take, you know, because I could put anything in there, because I'm J.J. Thompson, and I'm running the Cavendish Lab, and I have a bunch of graduate assistants, so get busy, minions. So they take little pieces of metal and make little pinwheels, put them on little tracks, and stick them in the ray tube. Well, guess what? Then when you apply the current, the little pinwheel starts to move. <laughs> this is an even better party trick than it was before. So you have this little pinwheel that's suddenly rolling down its little track. <laughs> so let me ask you this. If you're walking along, if you're walking through the hall and you see an object in the hall and it's moving, what, so your observation is there's an object, like a ball, rolling down the hall. As, as clever critters, such as yourselves, based on that observation, what could you infer? Okay, I heard three things and I think all of them were right. What'd you say? What'd you, something, rolled something rolled it. What'd you say? Something's what? Displacing. Something's displacing it. Did I hear something else? Something is acting on it, right? Some force is acting on it. It didn't just start to roll by itself. Something hit it. Something set it in motion. So the observation is for Thompson and his, his lab rats, I mean his graduate students, is that this pinwheel is moving. An object put in the path of a cathode ray actually moves. So what, they, what can they infer from that? Well, we'll get to that in a second. The other thing that they can do, more party tricks, pretty cool. If you set up the cathode ray and you take a magnet, where'd my magnet go? Well, it's not there. So, this is my magnet for right now. If we take a magnet and we stick the negative pole of the magnet up against the glass, the cathode ray bends away from it. Cool. And we can flip the magnet around and we can make the, ray, the cathode ray go wink, 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 do this all day. I probably would have if I was in the lab. Um, so, what do you know about charges? Like charges do what? Like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So whenever they stick something that's got a negative charge up against the glass, the cathode ray bends away from it. So the observation, the flat out observation is the cathode ray is repelled by a negatively charged object. What can you infer from that? Yeah. You can pretty conclusively say based on that that whatever that cathode ray is, we know it's got a negative charge. So, what J.J. Thompson proposes, 1897, this is less than 100 years after Dalton proposes that there's such a thing as an atom. Less than 100 years later, we're starting to break it down, which is kind of, I, I think that's pretty cool. Considering that we went like 1,500 years with pretty much nothing, I think this is, you know, breakneck progress. Wait till we get to the 1930s. Woo! So Thompson proposes that those ca the cathode ray is actually made of little tiny pieces of something, little chunks. So just like Dalton proposed that, you know, all matter is made of these tiny chunks, Thompson says, yeah, but a cathode ray is made of little pieces too, and those little pieces are negatively charged. Where does he get the idea that there are pieces? What, which of his two observations would lead him to say, yeah, there are actual physical chunks of something? The pinwheel spinning. If something's moving down the hall, something hit it. Something kicked it. Something pushed it. So there has to be some little physical particle that's actually hitting that pinwheel. I mean, it, it seems like a, a simple leap, but it's, it's kind of, I think it's... I'm not sure I'd make it on my own. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so he, he calls these little things electrons. And because we don't have any model for what the inside of an atom looks like at this point, he figures that we, we know that they are, that atoms are electrically neutral. Well, if you've got something that's electrically neutral, but it's got little negative pieces, then there must be something else that's positive, so it's all balanced. 
And he figures the, the most logical way that this could shake out would be little spheres with areas of positive charge, little areas of negative charge. So your little negative pieces have corresponding little positive pieces. He calls it the plum pudding model. Um, plum pudding is not a pudding like you guys know that's, you know, a delicious creamy dish made of milk and eggs and gets whipped cream on top. That's not the kind of pudding we're talking about here. Um, this is a British pudding. Trust me, they're really disappointing if you're expecting what we think of as pudding. Um, it's, oh, let's see, flour, potatoes, carrots, lard, raisins, um, all sort of steamed into a round lump and served at Christmas. Yeah, it's not what you think. Um, this is a model of sort of, it's not really a plum pudding, but something like it. A round thing with little pieces distributed evenly throughout it. Um, for Americans, the, the idea of the blueberry muffin model works better. That, you know, it's a muffin. There are blueberries scattered randomly throughout it. Okay? So this, this just adds to Dalton's work, that we have these little tiny objects. Now we're saying, yeah, and there are little areas of positive and negative, little pieces scattered throughout them. Okay, and this sounds pretty reasonable. This is, this is a step up. We now have, at this point, already broken down one of the tenets of Dalton's atomic theory. Which one? Which of the five tenets of Dalton's original proposal have we now broken? So yeah, um, Thompson is, is saying that they can in fact be divided. There is something smaller than the atom. Okay, so now we have the idea that there are positive chunks and negative chunks. This is good. What are we missing? Lots of things. So electrons are kind of all the rage at this point. Um, there, there's, there's a rush on this idea of flowing electrons because that's electricity. And, of course, this is prior to co electrification being common um, in much of any place. <clears throat> so a lot of people are working with electrons now because now we know that there are these little tiny charged particles. So Millikan, who we don't hear as much about, um, to, to explain it in some detail, it, the oil drop experiment basically involves using that idea that like charges repel so he sprays these tiny little droplets of oil into a chamber and they have to go through an opening in a plate to which he has applied a charge. So those oil droplets end up charged. And as they fall through the air, he can change the charge on the plate above and below them until he can get them to hover in midair because they're repelled by one charge and attracted by the other. And he can play with the current and play with the voltage until he can get them to mm. And doing that, and the, the actual math is, you know, about four billion steps beyond my abilities, he actually figures out not only the mass of the electron, but its charge. And what he finds is that it's really stinking tiny. That's the big upshot of this that electrons are really, really tiny. But he figures out the magnitude of their charge. Now, if atoms are electrically neutral, what else has he figured out? He's got the magnitude of the negative charge. Yeah. So he has, he has almost by default figured out the charge of the positive particle, because they've got to be equal charges. They have to be equal and opposite if the, part of, if the atom overall is neutral. So it's some important stuff. So now we've got a lot of information about electrons. We don't really have any information about any of the other pieces that make up an atom. <coughs> and the, the other things, because we've got so much information about electrons at this point, we know that they exist, we have their charge, we have their mass. Um, and, and Thompson had said this. There have to be other pieces that are positive for them to be neutral. Those charges have to be equal and opposite. But also, after Millikan discovers how just teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny electrons are, that doesn't add up to enough mass to make things have mass. So there has to be something else in there that makes atoms heavy. Something else 
has to account for its mass. Okay. Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford. So he's, got, he's actually got a great biography. Um, he was a farm boy from New Zealand. And this was kind of like an outpost of the empire at this point. It was, it was a backwater, to say the least. This was like living, you know, I don't know, a couple thousand miles from what was considered civilization if you were a citizen of the crown, which he was. Um, the, the fantastic quote that I can't, I can't find now, he attributed it later to his mother. Rutherford was known as a great experimentalist. So his, and this is, um, if you are a farm kid or you know a farm kid, this is the great strength of that kind of background. The ability to go, huh, well, I don't know. Let's see if we can fix that. What do you have? And you just figure it out. And it's this, you know, sort of pioneer mentality that, like, nope, you don't necessarily have exactly the tools you need. You don't necessarily have exactly the equipment you need. But you can figure something out. You can patch it together with duct tape and bailing wire. You can, you can make anything work. And that really drives a lot of the work he does in the Cavendish lab. He becomes known as this great improviser. And he, he quotes at some point in his life his mother as saying, well, Ernest, we haven't the money, so you must be clever. You know, and accounts of his biography, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't, they weren't destitute, but they did have a, a large family, and they were, you know, they were farming, so they weren't very wealthy. He was not part of the rich white guys in their basements club, and he didn't have a wealthy patron, but he had a really good brain. So he ends up in England at the Cavendish lab working in physics, and he's working on this problem because he believes that there has to be empty space in an atom, in between all these positive and negative bits. Because remember, he is still, along with everybody else, subscribing to this model. Let's see, 4 and 4 and 4 and 5 and, you know, that they're all kind of neatly, evenly spaced out. Positives and negatives, positive and, and negatives. But he figures there's got to be some empty space in there. So, how do you test that? Well, he takes chunks of material and he shoots what, we'll, what we later know are helium nucleuses, alpha particles, two protons bound together, but he doesn't know that, at the material and sees if he can get it to go through. And, you know, with a pretty good chunk of material, he can get a lot of particles to go through, and he keeps making that material thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until he gets down to gold foil. And when we say gold foil, you are all familiar with aluminum foil. We're talking about a sheet of gold foil that's so thin, it's almost one atom thick. It's incredibly thin, because metal has what characteristic? It is malleable, able to be pounded or rolled into thin sheets, and they take advantage of that characteristic. And this stuff is so thin, they set it up and they fire these little alpha particles at them. These little positively charged particles. And we know that these little particles are positively charged. He knows that. And he did, he did a lot of work with radiation. He actually gives us the idea of alpha particles and beta particles, alpha and beta emitters with nuclear radiation. So he shoots positive particles at it. And if you subscribe to this model of the atom, and you shoot a positive particle at that, what would you expect to happen? Well, it depends on where it hits. You know, some of them are going to come pretty close to a negative particle, and they might bend a little bit, and they might wiggle through because they're repelled by negatives. You know, and if you shoot one right here, or um, whoops, sorry. Yeah, they would be attracted here and repelled by the positives, you know, and they're going to, they're kind of going to weave their way, and, and you would expect to see some little deflections as they're attracted and repelled by the positive and negative particles in there, but for the most part, there's going to be enough of a balance of par positive and negative particles that most of them with some minor deflection should, should go through on a relatively straight path, and he kind of expects to see something like that, where most of them go through, and there are some small deflections. But the distribution of positives and negatives is thought to be even enough that they're just going to kind of wiggle a little bit. You know, and my drawing is not great. I'll be the first to admit. So this is what he expects to have happen. Okay. 
So he's firing into a black box. He doesn't know what the structure of the atom is. Let's shrink what we expect. So as they fire into that black box, because they don't know what it is, lots of the particles do go straight through. And then a very small number of them do this. Woo! They bounce right back. Um, the one metaphor I saw, Rutherford was quoted as saying, it was as if you had fired an artillery shell at a piece of tissue paper and had it bounce. You all know what a ricochet is. If you, if you fire a bullet at a metal wall, it's going to bounce back at you. Don't do that. If you fire a bullet at a snow pile, it should go straight through, right? This was akin to him firing a bullet at a snow pile and having a very small number of them, mind you, but a small number of them come straight back at him. Holy moly. So if only, it, if, if you fired, okay, if I took you out with a rifle and I gave you a big pile of snow and told you to fire through it and you just randomly fired through it for a while and every hundredth, every two hundredth bullet came bouncing straight back at you, what would you think? There's something in there. That is not just snow. Because snow doesn't behave that way. Would you not begin to suspect something? You'd shoot it again. Yeah, well, and that's what he kept doing. They kept shooting alpha particles at this gold foil. And they kept getting the same thing. Most of the alpha particles went straight through. A very small number came right back at you. So if you're shooting at a snow pile, might you think that there's something in there that's causing a ricochet? Yeah, this is not just snow. There's got to be something in the middle there that's causing a ricochet. And since it's only like every hundredth bullet that I fire, it can't be all that big. It's not like the whole thing is a steel dome under the snow. It's got to be pretty small. So what Rutherford proposes is that there's a tiny, that all that positive stuff is in one spot. That there's a little tiny core, a little nucleus, he calls it that has all the positive stuff. That all that positive stuff is tightly packed into a small area. And then it's tiny, but it's very, very positive. And that's why those alpha particles, some of them, are deflected straight back at him. <clears throat> so based on that inference, Rutherford proposes this new model. So up to now we've had the plum pudding model, which don't forget, Rutherford believed. This was the best model going. This was the best thing we knew. And science is all about what we know today. We may know something different tomorrow. We may have some information that modifies it tomorrow. But today, this is what we know. Um, <coughs> this is the model that gets drawn and painted and shown all over the place. It's the planetary model. And you've got this little nucleus. And you've got electrons just orbiting it in these little tracks. And it's called planetary because it looks like the sun and a bunch of planets. It looks like a little solar system, um, except they're typically shown in, you know, these little paths that cross, and it's, it's that symbol. It's the thing that ends up on T-shirts and mugs and, you know, Department of Defense websites. That's what you get. And this is the first, really, it's a better, it's a much more specific model of the atom than we've had prior to this. We now know about the nucleus. And the elect we, we know about the nucleus, we know that there are positive things in the nucleus, and we know that there are electrons and they're outside the nucleus. That's pretty good. The thing that has Rutherford completely puzzled, so protons have what charge? Positive. positive. We know that there are these little positive chunks. Electrons have negative. negative charge. What should happen when you have two objects that have opposite charges that are close? They should attract. Those electrons should be sucked right into the face of the nucleus. Like a little ship that got too close to the sun. Blah! They should be sucked right in. Why aren't they? That is the big unknown at this point. So here we are. This is very early 20th century. We've got a lot of information, but we're still lacking a few critical pieces. Now there's one other part of the atom we have not mentioned, right? Which is the neutron. 
James Chadwick. Man, you couldn't get any luckier than James Chadwick. So, Irene and Frederick Joilet Curie. I always screw it all up. But anyway, um, Irene Curie was the daughter of Marie and Pierre Curie. The Polish scientist. Well, Marie was Polish. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about uh, Pierre. Oh, duh, he was French. Okay, that's all that. <laughs> With a name like Pierre, you're probably not from Ireland. Um, so Irene is their daughter. She is also a scientist. She's quite brilliant in her own right. She meets Frederick Joali. What do you notice about their last name? It's hyphenated. They both took a hyphenated last name. She had, she had enough identity and pride with her name. She was not about to not be a Curie. And they had this very egalitarian thing going in 1932 where they both decided that they would take a combined last name and they would work and publish under that combined last name. It's pretty cool and pretty awesome. Um, so brilliant folks who were really unlucky. They missed the Nobel Prize, I think, three times. Um, science is a lot about oops. So... They did good work. They were actually bombarding, oh gosh, chunks of paraffin, I think, with gamma rays, so with high energy beams. And they were getting these pieces to come off. They were getting particles to come off of the material that they were bombarding. Well, they thought that what they were getting, I think they, they proposed that it was more gamma, it was a new kind of gamma radiation, they totally screwed up what they were seeing. What they thought they were seeing was not what they were seeing. Chadwick looks at their results and goes, <laughs> I know what you just got. I think you just found the neutral particle. I think you just found the big, massive neutral particle. So he repeats their, their experiment he gets the exact same results as them, but he explains it differently, and he explains it correctly. So, science isn't just about making good observations, it's about understanding what you're seeing. And sometimes about understanding what somebody else is seeing that they don't understand. So, yeah, the Curies, I, I believe it was three things that they had similar stuff, where they got good results, but they didn't interpret them correctly, and then other people came along and reinterpreted their work, and won Nobels, and the Curies didn't, the... Jolie Curies. Um, so Chadwick gets the credit for the discovery of the neutron, which is appropriate. It's not just what you get, it's knowing what you got. So now, in 1932, we know that there's a nucleus. We know that there are positive and neutral particles in the nucleus. And we know that there are negative particles orbiting outside it. This is pretty good. This is pretty much the picture we've got. Well, there's still one lingering problem which is why isn't the nucleus sucking the protons into it like a giant vacuum cleaner left to run? This is where the story gets really wacky, and this is where I think it gets to be the hardest to understand and the most disjointed. So let's actually pause here and pick it up in just a few minutes.